morning on this uh, Memorial Day weekend Sunday. Uh, it's, uh, I know we've got a lot of people that are out and traveling and on vacation and different things, but it's so good to see you here this morning. And uh, we want to begin this morning, if you got a prayer request, we want to pray over our prayer request this morning. If you got a prayer request, uh, raise your hand real quick and let me know about it. Miss Shirley? Yes, ma'am. Let's keep them in prayer this morning. Who, Miss Faye? Yeah, yeah, they're going to Hawaii. Yes. Yeah, I'm a little jealous about that. Yeah, yeah. Sydney was telling me about how he was going to be dreading that long plane flight out there. Was it 14 hours? Yeah. Yeah, they probably didn't got up yet. Yeah. Oh, well. Miss Doris, you raised your hand? Yeah, let's keep Kevin in prayer this morning. Somebody else today? Mom? Yes, ma'am. We'll just remember that family. A lot of issues going on. Let's... Yes, ma'am. That's exactly right. I was just fishing the to mention that too. I appreciate it. They, uh, they've had a rough week out in Texas, so let's remember those folks out there. Um, the families of those people that uh, that lost their kids and those families that lost those teachers and all of those law enforcement and border patrol agents. And there's going to be a lot of scrutiny and stuff going on about all that for a while, and they're going to have to answer a lot of questions, but we'll have to pray for them that everything will be good for them. Anybody else this morning? All right, let's pray this morning over our needs. Father, we love you so much, God. We thank you, God, for this wonderful day. Father, I thank you, Lord, for each and every one who's come this morning to, to be in Sunday school with us and, Lord, to, to learn more about your word. Father, we, we can't tell you, Lord, how much we love you, Lord Jesus. We just thank you, God, for your many, many, many blessings over us, Father. And we pray, God, for all of these needs today. God, we pray for these sick people, Lord. We pray for these uh, those that have lost their loved ones this week, God. We pray for our nation, Lord God. We pray for all of our, our people, our loved ones, and our family that are traveling this week, God. Lord, we pray you would give them traveling graces and safety, and God, that you would bring them back home, Lord, and God, that we could all be united in your house once again, Lord. We love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for all you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, we want to. Yeah, I'm. I'm so like grateful to be here. I, I am really grateful to be here. I am. Um, but uh, this morning we're we're going to continue. I think this is our last lesson in our book uh, for the spring session this morning. Uh, and the new books, I believe, are on that back table. Uh, so if you hadn't picked one up, it'll be the uh, the summer session. Uh, for the adult class so uh, brother Donnie will be back next week so he'll as far as I know pick up with that that lesson uh, number one in the summer session book so uh, you want to grab that uh, before you leave today uh, you can be prepared for for next Sunday when he's here uh, but this morning that we're, we're going to talk about God's healing presence uh, it says followers of Christ can be certain that one day they will know complete healing and restoration. Um, he goes into to talk about scriptures from Ezekiel. Now, I know we've talked about uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel uh, through all these lessons. Um, but Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel were the three prophets of the captivity period. Now, the captivity period was, was 606 B.C. until 536 B.C. Jeremiah was the oldest of these three, having begun his ministry uh, in the year 626 B.C. And next was Daniel. And Daniel, he began his ministry in about 607 uh, B.C. And uh, Daniel uh, was a member of Israel's royal family. So he spent most of his life ministering to the kings of Babylon and Persia and, and he lived through the entire 70 years of the captivity of Babylon. So 
then we, we've come through those two, and now we're to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, he was a priest. Uh, he spent his entire life as a prophet ministering to the captive Jews in Babylon. And this was from the period of year 592 B.C. until 570 uh, B.C. So this morning we're going to uh, bring our scriptures from Ezekiel 43 and Ezekiel 47. And uh, I want to read those scriptures uh, this morning. And I I'm going to read them from the New King James Version uh, to kind of simplify them a little bit. Uh, but Ezekiel 42, uh, for, excuse me, 43, verse 2, it says, And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with His glory. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And he said to me, Son of man, now let's remember what he said, Son of man, let's remember that. Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, they nor their kings, by their harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on their high places. Now we'll move on over to chapter 47 of Ezekiel, beginning in verse 1. And he says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running out on the right side. Again he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. For the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. And then he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. And when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. There will be great a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes along the bank of the river on the on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail they will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Now, we'll look back and, uh, and we'll, we'll start discussing uh, chapter 43, um, talking about God's presence returning to the temple. It says, after being taken to Babylon as a captive Jew in 597, Ezekiel never returned to Jerusalem. However, on several occasions, he was in visions alone, transported back to Jerusalem by the Holy Spirit. Early in his ministry in Babylon, Ezekiel was given a vision of the glory of God departing from the temple of Jerusalem. And then near the end of his ministry in Babylon, Ezekiel was given this vision of the glory of, uh, of, the glory of God returning to the temple. And God's glory departing from the temple signified his judgment against the Jews and God's glory returning to the temple signified his favor towards the Jews. Where God's glory is manifested, there his presence is also manifested. Now, I want us to look at this and, and realize that manifestation of God's presence is the foundation of faith and confirmation of his power and his glory. Uh, for any of us who, who have uh, come and and actually experience God's presence in, in the house. Uh, when you come in and, and you can feel almost, you know, goosebumps 
uh, on, on your skin or you can feel a, a, a chill of a, a mighty wind blowing in the house. I, I've even uh, heard it described uh, in certain places uh, around the world as uh, the sound of a mighty roaring wind that comes through uh, the sanctuary. And uh, I, Brother Randy is, has come up with... Um, Examples of that. There was a church in Alaska, and, and we've heard that before in one of his, some of his sermons. That they actually caught this this sound on uh, recording on uh, audio tape, uh, and you could hear the sound of the mighty rushing wind that came through the sanctuary, signifying the uh, uh, the presence of God in the house. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing feeling, an amazing sensation to have when God's presence shows up. Uh, when God's presence shows up, I want you to know that if you experience God's presence truly, then you are changed. Your life is forever more changed. You no longer have a faith that is based solely on uh, words out of our our our, bo- our Bible alone. You have a feeling. You have a a, a physical uh, a physical being uh, inside of you to base your faith over. You have felt it. You have experienced it. You know that it's real. It, it it's not something that you can guess about, or it's not something that you can uh, make speculation about anymore. It's something that you can grab a hold of and hold on to and truly have confirmation of what God's power and His glory is truly all about. Uh, and for those of you who may have may not have experienced uh, that kind of, of revelation yet, I pray that you would seek God more and more and more so that you could, could be... Uh, manifested into his presence and feel exactly what he he has and what God is made up of. It's a, a truly life changing experience that will never leave you the same as you were before. Um, it changes you, it, and the Bible talks about this in several different places. I want to talk about Matthew. Uh, now, this is not in our our Sunday school book, but as I was studying through it, uh, God just kind of brought it to my attention of, of what it may be but Matthew 17 uh, verse 2 it, it says uh, this is talking about the transfiguration and after six days beginning in verse 1 after six days Jesus took Peter James and John the brother of James and led them up a high mountain where they could be alone verse 2 says Jesus's appearance changed in front of them his face became as bright as the sun and his clothes as white as light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them and were talking with Jesus. He talks about Jesus' appearance being white as light and, and his clothing shining like the sun. That's the, the type of, of change that occurred on, on Jesus, which is the, the manifestation man he is the, the manly body of, of God. Um, when he came in the presence of the Father at the uh, Mount of Transfiguration, his appearance changed. Uh, also, let's look at Exodus chapter 34. I want us to go there and uh, see what Moses, what it says about Moses and what he um, experienced as well. Matthew, I mean, Exodus 34, 29. Flip to it here. It says, Moses returns to the people. Moses came down from Mount Sinai carrying two tablets with God's words on them. His face was shining from the speaking with the Lord, but he didn't know it. He had experienced God's presence on Mount Sinai whenever God gave him those Ten Commandments to write on the two tablets. He'd experienced God's presence and he didn't even know, but when he came down back to the people that he was leading, his face was shining. He says uh, his face was shining from speaking with the Lord. The presence of God changes you. It changes your appearance. It changes everything about you. The presence of God changes not only your appearance, but it changes your inner desires and your inner workings and it truly 
gives meaning to what the desires of God are inside of each and every one of us. It will change your desires from being those desires of trying to uh, please your flesh or trying to uh, get things of, of the world. It changes those desires from those type of things to the desires of the Spirit. Uh, those things being um, more word, uh, more fellowship, uh, more service. Those types of things that are of a spiritual nature, of more, uh, more beneficial to our spirits. Those are the type of things that the presence of God changes within us. Now, we'll, we'll move down to verses 6 through 9. It says, After Ezekiel saw God's glory return to the temple, God granted him understanding of what this meant. And God made two promises to his people, the Jews. And first, he would live among them forever if they would serve him faithfully. And second, God would free his people of their sinfulness. They would never again defile the Lord's name or serve false gods. And this stood in stark contrast to the idolatrous history of the Israelites before the captivity. The captivity and exile cured the Jews permanently of idolatry. Now in verse 7 note that verse 7 alludes to the vile practice of prostitution that was part of the worship of false gods. Verse 7 and 9 refer to the practice of burying kings of Judah next to the temple which was against the law um, of, of burying, of having defiled bodies uh, on the grounds of the temple. That was, that was against the law. And after the Jews had endured the disappointing departure of God's glory from the temple and its subsequent destruction, which they never thought could happen. They never thought that the temple could be destructed. The two promises of God in verses 7 and 9 provided them great encouragement regarding their future. God's promises, however, included His expectation that the Jews would live as His holy people. God is holy and His commands His people to be as well. Leviticus chapter 11, 44 says that. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, that says that. But how could they be made able to live as God's holy people? Now, this is just a, a side note that, that I wrote down. Holy living is impossible for man alone. Did you know that? You can try just as hard as you want to. You can, you can do everything within your power. You can try to, to live as holy a life as possible that you can. But you'll never succeed. It's not made up in us. Uh, we have a sinful nature. We were born with a sinful nature. God knew it. God knew it whenever we fell in the Garden of Eden, way back in the, in the first of creation, whenever Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, that's when the sinful nature was imparted into us. And when ever since then, we have so have strayed away from the path that God set for us. It, it was like a tangent set, set aside just because of the sinful nature. And everything that God has brought us through, every bit of the Bible that we study is imparted in the Bible just to bring us off of that tangent and back to the original plan God created for us in the beginning, before the fall of man. Every one of us have a sinful nature, and that's why it's impossible for us to live a holy life. Now, God promised a new heart to the Jews. Now, this was a, a pre-Jesus period. This was, in, this was B.C. times. Uh, this was a time when Jesus hadn't, hadn't come. We didn't have a Messiah. We didn't have a Savior. We were promised that, that He was coming, uh, but, but He hadn't come yet. No Messiah had been born. No, saving, uh, no Savior. Holy living and, and, uh, and honoring God was the way that you were to, to uh, have your faith based on. The cross of Christ and His sacrifice are the reasons that we can live up to God's standard, standards of being holy. Now, I, I don't have to explain this. To, I'm preaching to the choir here, but 
It's because of Jesus, it's because of His cross and His sacrifice for us that we are able to live up to the standards of God. It's because of His righteousness. righteousness. That's what's so hard for people to understand. That's what's so hard for people that are not saved to understand. That it's nothing you can do on this earth that affords you your salvation. I, I had to uh, preach a homecoming last Sunday at, at a different church, and, and I brought the message from uh, the prodigal son uh, parable. And and the son had had fell away from. Of course, he had, he had come and and uh, told his father that he wanted his inheritance, and he left with all of his his uh, money in his pockets and nothing but time on his hands. And he left, and he went out into the world. And he went out and he tried and to do everything within his, his uh, manly desires to fulfill what he wanted. I mean, he had the money to spend. He had nothing else to do. He went out and he blew it all. He blew it all and when it was all gone, he wound up in the pig pen. And when he was in the pig pen eating the same stuff that the pigs was eating, he knew then that even the servants of his father were better off than what he was. And so he decided, when he came to his senses, he decided he'd go back home. He'd go back and he would be a servant uh, 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 to his father. He'd, he'd be a hired hand, so to speak, because even the hired hands were treated better than what he had. It. So he went back home and, and uh, when he got there, before he could even talk to his dad, he, um, the, his, his father saw him coming from a long distance away. And before he could even get there, his dad ran out and grabbed him and he kissed him. And before he could even ask for his father's forgiveness, before he could ever tell his God, that, uh, his father, that I have sinned not only against you, but I have sinned against heaven. Before he could ever even say that, the father came up, kissed him on his neck and told his servants to bring out the robe, bring out the ring. Bring out some shoes for his feet. All of those things were bestowed upon the son before he could even ask forgiveness for it. Now that's the kind of restoration that our God gives us. God, God gives us restoration before we could ever even ask for it. All we got to do is come to him. That's where our salvation comes in. You know, whenever, whenever we try our best to to lay, up, lay aside our sins and, and lay aside our, our differences uh, in God's will that we desire, in God's desires, that's where we mess up and get away from, from our salvation. But here is the issue. You can never, ever pay for your salvation. All you have to do is believe. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. That's all you got to do. And, and I, I was saying before the parable, so many people will never be saved on this earth because of that simple fact. They cannot grasp that fact that they can't pay for their salvation. And they're out in the world and, and they're living the, the ways of the world and they think that they've got to change their ways before they come to God. They think that they've got to clean themselves up before they come to God. And that's not... Exact, that, that's exactly not what they're supposed to do. You come to God and God cleans you up. You come into His presence and He cleans you up. Do you, he, he, let me tell you, do you know that if you could clean yourself up, if you could change yourself, why would we need God? Why would we need God if we could do it ourselves? That's, that God knew that we had this issue from the very beginning. He knew that, that that was going to be our problem. So every since then, his plan was to uh, uh, get us away from sin, and Jesus was the answer. And it's because of his righteousness that takes the place of our unrighteousness. Paul says in the Word that his righteousness is as filthy rags. How many else has some filthy rag righteousness? Come on, I, give me a hand. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Don't get quiet on me. Who else has some filthy rag righteousness? I tell you, there's, there's stuff that we deal with every day in this world that, that man just tears our righteousness apart. 
And no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we struggle, we're still going to mess up. We we have messed up. We are messing up. And we will mess up again. Jesus is the reason we have our righteousness. We were at home. I guess it was last weekend or a couple weekends ago. And, uh, Marita had, had made a little gift for our neighbor. And we uh, went over and, and gave the, the gift to our neighbor. And our, our neighbor is a pastor. Uh, he doesn't pastor a church. He's a retired pastor. But he still preaches uh, from time to time. And he and I were talking while uh, Marita was over talking to his wife. And uh, he and I were talking and we were discussing some words and different things. And he said, man, brother, I tell you, he said, I done fell already this morning. I said, what? He said, yeah, me and Jan, Jan's his wife, and she just made me so blasted mad. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. I, I didn't ask any questions. He just, he was confessing to me, you know, he was confessing. Then I said, oh, oh, okay. She wants to cut that whole yard with a push mower. I told her not to. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Lord have mercy. That's the greatest thing. I, all I could say was, brother, I got a ride mower home. I'd be glad to come cut your grass for you. <laughs> That's all I could think to say. You know, but he says, he says, I done, I done got mad already this morning and fell. I said, he said, but you know, we got we to gotta get back up. I said, That's right, brother. I said, That's right. You know, he and his wife had had a disagreement about cutting the grass, and that was his sin for the day, his early morning sin. So it, it, that just proves, you know, just goes to prove my, my point that, you know, every one of us are in the same shape. We're all in the same boat. We all have the sinful nature, but one thing that we can all have in common is Jesus and His salvation and, and His righteousness that we can accept, put it on. And, and live just as, as God would have us to live. Now, I'm going to move on. That, that was way, uh, way further into that than I wanted to get, but I, I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Now, we'll go on to, to chapter 47 of Ezekiel, talking about the river flowing from the, uh, from the temple. It says, Ezekiel 47 marks a transition of focus from the temple to the land of Israel. Now, verses 1 through 12 describe a living, giving stream that flowed from the temple out over the land of Israel, becoming an increasingly larger river and reaching all the way to the Dead Sea, an arid area devoid of life. In ancient Israel, water was both scarce and essential for survival, and as a result, this water was regarded by the Jews as a symbol of abundance and blessing. However, this vision of Ezekiel is not merely about water, but about a life-giving river from the temple, thus in enhancing its significance as a source of God-given abundance and blessing. Ezekiel's vision of this life-giving river, which began at the temple and flowed out over the land of Israel, must have suggested to the post-captivity Jews that their future as God's people would be abundantly blessed by God. How many is thankful for that river of living water flowing from the temple? I'm telling you, without that living water, where, well, where would we be? Now, the, the significance of this is, it, it says that the, uh, the angel of God came and, and was showing him out of the temple and that he took him out and he ventured out into this water four different times and he went in increments of a thousand cubits. Now, a thousand cubits is about 1,500 feet. Now, four times it took him out 1,500 feet. Now, one mile is 5,280 feet, right? So four times 1,500 feet, that's 6,000 feet. 6,000 is more than 5,280, right? So we're talking about a water that is more than a mile wide. Now, I've been over to the mighty Mississippi a lot of times when I was little. We would go over and we'd fish in the Mississippi River. And they say in some places that it's a mile wide. I'll agree with that. Uh, that is a, not a body of water that you want to walk out into. Uh, when you get that much water flowing in one direction, 
That is some dangerous, dangerous stuff. It's a powerful, powerful thing for that kind of water. Well, the Bible says that this water is, pretty, is, is way wider than that. You think about the power that that water has. Not just in, in bringing life. If you go over to, to around the, the Mississippi River, or not just the Mississippi, but any river in general, you'll notice that there's always heavy vegetation growing around the water. There's always, uh, um, when, when I'm hunting, when I'm walking through the woods, I come up to a creek. You know, there's always hardwood trees along my creek, mostly. Um, there's always uh, thick brush. The reason being is because there's usually the presence of water there. And that water is what gives life. This is the same thing. This is exactly what this is insinuating here, that this is life-giving water flowing from the temple. 1,500 times 4, 6,000 feet wide at least. Now, the, the blessings of restoration, I spoke about that just a second ago when I talked about the prodigal son, that he was restored. These, uh, these mentionings of the father telling the servants to go and retrieve the, the greatest robe, and to go and retrieve a ring for his finger, and to go and get him some feet, uh, shoes for his feet. Those are symbolic of the restoration taking place in the Son. He was restored in his original position as before he left. Yeah, he came back asking to be a servant, asking to be a hired hand to his father, but no. When he came back and presented himself to his father, instantly he was restored to the position he had as the son before he left. That's the type of restoration that our God offers us. Our God gives us those restoring uh, values within us. Now, it talks about these living waters, uh, the life-giving waters, flowing down toward the, the sea. Now, what this is talking about is the Dead Sea. Um, in Ezekiel's vision, the power of the life-giving river is seen as a causing of numerous trees to grow along its banks, restoring the water of the Dead Sea to freshness and restoring life to every living thing wherever it goes. Now, we, we've all been to the ocean. We've all been to the Gulf Coast. I, I say we all have. You know, in, we, most of us have. You go down to the, to the Gulf or, or wherever you go, and you go out and you go swimming, and, you know, just by happen chance, you go swimming, you're going to get that salty water in your mouth. You know how salty that water is, how nasty tasting. you got to get it out of there. Well, that water is about 4% salt content that normal you know, seawater is 4% salt content. The Dead Sea has a salt content of 33%. Now that's a little over eight times the salt content of normal seawater is what's in the Dead Sea. So nothing can live in the Dead Sea. No, there's no fish in the Dead Sea. There's no plant life. There's no vegetation. There's no trees along the bank. Nothing can live in, in those type of, dead, uh, of waters. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. There's nothing there. It's all, everything's dead. But the Bible speaks of these living waters that flows from the temple that will flow into the sea that would heal the waters of the Dead Sea. That's, that's how powerful these waters are, that it would, it would heal the waters of the Dead Sea and that it says fish would start to live. Uh, Life-giving river restored life to the Dead Sea and the land surrounding it. So not only did the sea regain the fish and the, and the vegetation of, a, of, a, a, of original seawater, but it says that it restored all life around it. So that's when the, the trees would start growing. And the Bible talks about how the trees would come in and they, they wouldn't wither. They wouldn't lose their, their leaves. That They would come in and they would have uh, fruit every month of the year. Every month of the year, these, these trees would produce fruit and uh, it would give them food to eat and the leaves of the trees 
would give them medicine for what they would need for, for healing not uh, in their bodies as well. These were healing waters that was flowing from the temple. Now, I believe today, and, and several other scholars have agreed, uh, this is where I get it from, but Christ is the flowing river of the temple. Jesus, His presence, His, his salvation is the, flow, the river of flowing life from the temple. He's what heals us. The Spirit of God is what gives us the healing. The flowing river of help, life blessing and healing all comes from the temple and His name is Jesus. Ezekiel 47 and 7. It says that the vision of the flowing, uh, the river flowing from the temple meant to the captive Jews of Babylon. It certainly has meaning for Christians. It signifies the present blessings of salvation provided to us by Christ. Ephesians 1 and 3 emphasizes that. The blessings that will attend the establishment of Christ's millennial kingdom on earth not only now, but in Revelation 21 and verse 1 talks about the new heaven and the new earth. That is what this signifies the coming of. The coming of, of the things uh, spoken of in Revelation. The river of the temple coming out to not only sustain us now, but to establish us in the, the, the millennial reign to come of Christ. Now we've talked about that uh, in our studies of revelations um, and, and other uh, prophetic scriptures leading up to that. But this is one of the, uh, the prophetic uh, visions given to Ezekiel to, uh, to reassure him on that. Now, living in this world plagued by human sinfulness, we need Ezekiel's vision of God's life-giving, life-sustaining, and healing river. As believers in Christ, we are not without help to thrive in this imperfect world. Believing in Christ, we drink of the water of life, and in that we have all we need to make us sufficient for life, death, and eternity. Let us remind ourselves daily that we need the water of life. Drink of it freely and thank God for it. We have everlasting life in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this wonderful day. And God, we thank you for your many, many blessings. Thank you, God, for this lesson. And the word has gone forth. God, we, we love you. God, we pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, we would take heed, Lord, of these healing waters. Father, that we would seek to be more in your presence, God. That, Lord, we could be changed fully, Lord, because of of your presence in our lives, God. Lord, we give it all to you. We present it all to you. Lord, we pray you would forgive us of our, our sins and our failures, Lord. God, help us to be more like you every day. Lord, have your way in this service today, O oh God, and we give you praise and glory in advance for all you're going to do. In Jesus' holy name. Everybody said amen. amen. Thank you for your attendance this morning. Um, we'll get ready for our...